Sections 9 to 12 of How to Sing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. How to Sing by Lily Lehman. Translated by Richard Aldrich. Section 9. Sensation and Position of the Tongue. We feel the placing of its tip against or beneath the front teeth. I place the tip very low so that it really curves over in front. Its hinder part must be drawn back toward the palate in the pronunciation of every letter. Furthermore, by looking in the mirror, we can see that the sides of the tongue are raised as soon as we wish to form a furrow in it. That is, as we must do to produce the palatal resonance. Only in the head tone, without the added palatal or chest resonance, has the tongue no furrow. It must, however, lie very high, since otherwise its mass, when it lies flat, presses against the larynx and produces pinched or otherwise disagreeable tones. The best way is to get the mass of the tongue out of the way by forming the furrow in it. In high notes, when the larynx must stand as closely as possible, the back of the tongue also must stand very high, but since there is a limit to this, we are compelled to make the larynx take a lower position, to call in the assistance of the vowel OO. The correct position of the tongue preparatory to singing is gained by saying the vowel sound OW, as if about to yawn. The tongue must not turn over upward with its tip. As soon as the tip has been employed in the pronunciation of the consonants L, N, S, T, and Z, in which its service is very short and sharp, it must return to its former position and keep to it. It is best to watch the movements of the tongue in the mirror until we have formed the correct habit permanently. The more elastic the tongue is in preparing the form for the breath to pass through, the stiller will it appear, the stiller will it feel to us. It is well, however, for a considerable time to watch in a mirror all functions of the organs that can be seen, the expression of the face, the position of the tongue, the position of the mouth, and the movement of the lips. End of section 9 Section 10. The Sensations of the Nose By distending the nostrils, the pillars of the fauces inflate. The nose, therefore, effects this function. Without the action of the nose, it would remain inactive. The energetic drawing up of the tendons at the nose towards the eyes and forehead, and towards the temples and beyond to the ears while singing, is an exceptionally important help. The vowels E and A especially demand this tensed nose position. But the singer does very well when he uses it with all other vowels and tones, so as to preserve their ringing and carrying quality. We singers have therefore to pay attention to renew continually these given nose functions. It happens that in the pronunciation of consonants, which must be pronounced in the A position, one must begin with A and end with it, as for example N, which must be pronounced in singing N, thus renewing the nose functions three times in one letter, not to speak of the very delicate wave-like nuances which have to be produced in the N sound itself. All this is to make the letter resonant. More on this subject later. Nose and tongue functions should be practised first. End of section 10. Section 11. The Sensations of the Palate. The sensations of the palate are best made clear to us by raising the softest part behind the nose. This part is situated very far back. Try touching it carefully with the finger. It is of immeasurable importance to the singer. 
by raising it, the entire resonance of the head cavities is brought into play. Consequently, the head tones are produced. When it is raised, the surface of the pillars of the fauces is reduced in size. In its normal position, it allows the pillars to be distended and to close off the head cavities from the throat in order to produce the chest tones. That is, to permit the breath to make fullest use of the palatal resonance. As soon as the soft palate is lowered under the nose, it makes a point of resonance for the middle range of voice by permitting the overtones to resound at the same time in the nose. Thus the palate performs the whole work so far as concerns the different resonances, which can be united and separated by it, but must always work together in close relation, always bound together in all tones, in all kinds of voices. The lowest chest tones of the bass, the highest head tones of the soprano, are thus the two poles between which the entire gamut of all voices can be formed. From this it can be perceived that with a certain degree of skill and willingness to work, every voice will be capable of great extension. End of section 11 Section 12 The Sensation of the Resonance of the Head Cavities the sensation of the resonance of the head cavities is perceived chiefly by those who are unaccustomed to using the head tones. The resonance against the occipital walls of the head cavities when the head tones are employed at first causes a very marked irritation of the nerves of the head and ear, but this disappears as soon as the singer gets accustomed to it. The head tones can be used and directed by the breath only with a clear head. The least depression such as comes with headaches, megrim or moodiness may have the worst effect, or even make their use quite impossible. This feeling of oppression is lost after regular conscious practice, by which all unnecessary and disturbing pressure is avoided. In singing very high head tones, I have a feeling as if they lay high above the head, as if I were setting them off into the air. Here, too, is the explanation of singing in the neck. The breath in all high tones, which are much mixed with head tones, or which use them entirely, passes very far back, directly from the throat into the cavities of the head and thereby, and through the oblique position of the larynx, gives rise to the sensations just described. A singer who inhales and exhales carefully, that is, with knowledge of the physiological processes, will always have a certain feeling of pleasure, an attenuation in the throat as if it were stretching itself upward. The bulging out of veins in the neck that can so often be seen in singers is as wrong as the swelling up of the neck, looks very ugly, and is not without danger from congestion. With rapid scales, one has the feeling of great firmness of the throat muscles, with trills of a certain stiffness of the larynx. See trills. An unsteady movement of the latter, this way and that, would be disadvantageous to the trill, to rapid scales, as well as to the cantilena. For this reason, because the changing movements of the organs must go on quite imperceptibly and inaudibly, it must be more like a shifting than a movement. In rapid scales, the lowest tone must be placed with a view to the production of the highest and in descending, the greatest care must be exercised that the tones shall not tumble over each other single, but shall produce the sensation of closely connected sounds through being bound to the high tone position and pressed toward the nose. In this, all the participating vocal organs must be able to keep up a muscular contraction, often very rigid, 
the form remain tensed, one organ to another. And in this tension, one or the other vocal organ, as larynx, tongue, diaphragm, palate, or nose, must act with especial elasticity or especial strength, according to the necessity of accent or according to the physical condition of the singer. Only gradually, through long years of careful and regular study, is it to be achieved. Excessive practice is of no use in this, only regular and intelligent practice, and success comes only in course of time. Never should the muscular contractions become convulsive and produce pressure which the muscles cannot endure for a long time. They must respond to all necessary demands upon their strength, yet remain elastic in order that, easily relaxing or again contracting, they may promptly adapt themselves to every nuance in tone and accent desired by the singer. A singer can become and continue to be master of his voice and means of expression only as long as he practices daily conscious vocal gymnastics. In this way alone can he obtain unconditional mastery over his muscles and, through them, of the finest controlling apparatus, of the beauty of his voice, as well as of the art of song as a whole. Training the muscles of the vocal organs, so that their power to contract and relax to all desired degrees of strength throughout the entire gamut of the voice is always at command, makes the master singer. End of section 12